you have probably heard the term proof of reserves a lot in the past few weeks. After the collapse of FTX, many exchanges tried to prove to their users that their coins are safe by publishing proof of reserves reports. The problem here is that when you try to read these reports, you will see many confusing terms like the Merkle trees or the root hash, and you may be wondering, what is a Merkle tree or a Merkle root, and what does it have to do with your coins? Well, you are not the only one who doesn't understand these terms, as they can be confusing to many average crypto users, not just beginners. But don't worry, you will find the answers to many of your questions in this video. Welcome to Cryptobi, where we explain cryptocurrencies and DeFi topics in the most simple and beginner-friendly way. In this video, you will know what is proof of reserves and how it actually works, and at the end, we will talk about some limitations of proof of reserves, so let's get started. So, what is proof of reserves? Simply, proof of reserves is a type of assessment or audit done to prove that an exchange actually has its users' deposits or assets. The audit is usually done by an independent third party, which is an auditing firm in most cases. The word reserves mean the assets held or controlled by an exchange or a platform, and for us to make sure that an exchange actually has its users' assets, we have to verify that the amount of coins the exchange currently holds, known as the reserves, is larger than or equal to the amount of coins the exchange holds for its users, which is known as the liabilities. So we have to know the two amounts, the amount of coins they currently have and the amount of coins they owe to their users. Let's start with the amount of coins an exchange owes to its users. So an exchange may publicly state that their total liabilities amount is 10,000 bitcoins for example, which means that they owe to their users 10,000 bitcoins. The problem here is that we don't really know if that number is right or not, as the exchange may leave some accounts out or report some wrong balances to try and make their liabilities appear smaller to the public. So, for us to verify that this number is correct, we will need a full list of users' accounts and their balances so that anyone can check and see if his account was included or not, and also whether the reported balance is correct or not. So if anything is wrong, we would know. But as you may be thinking, Privacy is a big problem here, as the exchange is revealing users' balances to the public, which is something that nobody wants. So, to try and solve this problem, exchanges are now using something called a Merkle tree, which allows any exchange to publish their total liabilities amount, while still allowing any user to check if his account was included and reported correctly into that number or not. All of this is done while still maintaining privacy and without revealing any information to the public about the user's accounts or their balances. So, before we explain Merkle trees, you first need to understand something called a hash function. If you already know what a hash function is, you can skip this part. So, a hash function is like a black box that you give it any type of data, and it will give you a hash, which is a series of 64 letters and numbers. Some hashing functions can give you hashes with different lengths, but they are outside the scope of our video, here we are talking about the SHA-256 hashing function. So this black box uses very complex math to convert any type of data you give it into 64 letters and numbers. You can give it just a single word, an entire book, or an image, it will always give you a hash of 64 letters and numbers for this data. If you try and give it the same input many many times, it will always give you the same hash. But if you slightly change the input data, like replacing a small letter with a capital one, it will give you an entirely different hash. A very important thing to know here about the hashing functions is that they are one-way functions, meaning that you can get a hash from the data, but you can never reverse the hash to get the input data. For example, there is nothing you can do to get the input data from this hash. So just remember that hashing functions are one-way only, you can never get the data from a hash. Now, let's get to how proof of reserves actually works using Merkle trees. So when a proof of reserves audit is done, the exchange generates a list of all its users' accounts and their balances. Each account on any exchange has an ID or an account number. So the exchange hashes the account numbers or IDs and then gives them with the balances to the auditing firm. The account numbers or IDs are hashed to preserve users' privacy and to avoid leaking their balances. So now the auditing firm will start generating the Merkle tree. For simplicity, here we will assume the users held only two assets, Bitcoin and Ethereum. So they will take each account number, add to it its balance, and then 
put all of this into the hash function to generate a hash. This hash and the balance of the account together form what is known as a Merkle leaf. As you can see, each user account will be represented by a Merkle leaf, and all the accounts will be represented in the tree. After that, the balances of each two sibling leaves or accounts are added together, and the two hashes will go into the hash function again to get a new hash. This new hash with the sum of the two balances form what is known as a Merkle branch. After we get the first layer of branches, we do the same thing again by adding the balances of each two sibling branches and hashing the two hashes again to get the next layer of branches. And we will continue doing this until we get the final hash, which is called the Merkle root or the root hash. And with it, we will get the total balance of all users' accounts, which is the total liabilities the exchange owes to its users. This Merkle root we got is the hash that summarizes all users' accounts and their balances, and it's published by the exchange and the auditing firm after the audit is completed. This hash allows any user to check if his account was included in this liabilities number or not. You may be wondering, how can anyone verify that his account was included using this Merkle root? Well, you can verify by recalculating the Merkle root using your account data. The exact steps usually differ from an exchange to another, and you can find exact instructions on your exchange website. But, for example, if at the time of the audit, you had one Bitcoin and five Ethereum, then you can form your Merkle leaf by hashing these balances with your hashed account number. The auditing firm will provide you with the sibling hashes at each level, so you can use them to manually find your way to the Merkle root. As you can see, you don't need all the hashes, you just need the top-level hash of the other side, as well as the sibling hashes at each level on your side. If you manually calculated the Merkle root and found it the same as the published Merkle root, then you can be sure your account was included in the total liabilities number with the balances you used in the leaf. Of course, not all users have the technical knowledge to do this verification manually, so most auditing firms and exchanges offer a verification website that does all of this to you and shows you where is your account on the Merkle tree and its path to the Merkle root. Before we continue, if you have been enjoying the video so far, hit the like button as a new channel, it really helps us. So now the exchange has published the Merkle root and anyone can verify that his account was included while still maintaining users' privacy as all these hashes in the leaves cannot be used to get the user's data. So now we know how much an exchange owes to its users, but how can we make sure that they actually have these amounts of coins? Well, as you may know, the balances of all wallet addresses can be seen by anyone on the blockchain. So the exchange will provide the auditing firm with the addresses they own and the balance of each address. Sometimes, the exchange will publish these addresses and their balances to the public. The problem here is that we need to make sure that the exchange actually owns these addresses. In most cases, we do that through two methods. The first method is by asking the exchange to sign a message with their private keys. What happens is that the auditing firm will give the exchange a message and ask them to sign it with the private keys of the addresses they claim to own. After the message is signed, the auditing firm can verify the signature and make sure that the exchange actually has the private keys of these addresses, which means that they control these addresses. The second method for verification is the send to self transaction, which may be used when a blockchain doesn't support the signature method. Here, the auditing firm will ask the exchange to make a send to self transaction from each of the addresses they claim to own. A send to self transaction is when an address sends crypto to itself. So the auditing firm will ask the exchange to make send to self transactions with specific amounts at specific time periods from these addresses. Then they will verify the transactions details. If the exchange can send these transactions from these addresses, then this means that they actually control these addresses. So the balances of these addresses will be added together to get the total amount of coins the exchange currently has. Then this number will be compared with the total liabilities number we got from the Merkle tree. For example, let's say that the total liabilities are 10,000 Bitcoins and 100,000 Ethereum coins, and the total assets the exchange currently controls are 10,000 and 200 Bitcoins and 103,000 Ethereum coins. When the auditing firm issues their proof of reserves report, they will calculate the collateralization ratio for each asset by dividing the amount of coins the exchange currently controls by the liabilities amount of this asset. So the exchange in our example will have a collateralization ratio of 102% for Bitcoin and 103% for Ethereum, which means that they have assets more than their liabilities. But if you find the collateralization ratio in the report less than 100%, then the exchange is insolvent, 
as they have assets less than their liabilities. So if all the users want to withdraw their assets at the same time, the exchange wouldn't be able to give the users their money, which is a scenario known as a bank run. Before we end the video, let's talk about some limitations of proof of reserves. So the proof of reserves audit is a point in time audit. So we know how much an exchange owes to users and how much it has at the time of the audit. But we don't know what happened before or after the audit. For example, the exchange could have borrowed the assets before the audit. Although this will be pretty obvious on the blockchain, but it is still a possibility. Also, like what we said, we don't know what happens after the audit. So the exchange may have lost the keys to some wallets, or the assets may have been stolen or given to a third party after the latest proof of reserves audit. So an exchange who really cares about assuring their users that their assets are safe should perform the proof of reserves audit periodically, like every three or six months. Another limitation of proof of reserves is that the results will depend on the auditor's skills and expertise. Some exchanges may have complex scenarios with many different crypto assets and some fiat assets. So, a well-known and experienced auditing firm will produce the most accurate results in these cases. Another limitation here is the possibility of collusion between the exchange and the auditing firm to produce misleading results. So with proof of reserves audits, you need to trust the third-party auditor. But this risk can be minimized if the auditing firm is well-known with good reputation. But like with anything in the crypto space, you always need to do your own research before taking any decisions. At the end of this video, we hope you learned what you need to know about proof of reserves and how it works, and if you liked our video and want to reward our hard work, hit the like button, let us know in the comments if you have any questions or video ideas, and subscribe to our channel and turn on the notifications so you don't miss our new videos. Thanks for watching.